I want to do something a little different today. See, as a historian, most of my time and effort is spent cataloging the long arcs of civilizations or spotlighting those brief shining moments. Stories with lasting impacts that are fun to tell because they feel so weighty and important. After all, it's not every day that Athens trips into inventing democracy or Sparta fights the Persians at Thermopylae, but that's the thing. It's not every day. Those big achievements stand out precisely for how rare they are. And while characters like them get top billing in all the stories, we can easily forget about everyone else. The hundreds of side characters and thousands of extras who were there the whole time and comprise most of the human experience by volume, but for whatever reason, never land in history's spotlight. The people who lived their lives and left the world more or less as they found it, or in rare cases, those who almost hit it big, almost changed everything, almost made history. These stories are inevitably last to be recorded and first to be forgotten, but were constantly playing out in the background of other people's glory. So today I want to spotlight one. Noxos. Wait, who? Yes, Naxos, the largest island in the Cycladic Archipelago, and perhaps the most vivid example of a history that doesn't really go anywhere. And for that exact reason, I find it fascinating. So, to see what almost happened in Little of Naxos, let's do some history. As we'll soon discover, written records about Naxos are thin and sparse, so our most consistent and reliable narrator is going to be the island itself. The material culture left behind thousands of years ago pieced together into a fuller narrative by the hard work of archaeologists. With that in mind, the story of Naxos as we understand it is one big story of marble. And suddenly, it makes perfect sense why Blue is talking about Naxos of all places. Dear viewers, I am nothing if not consistent in my aesthetic sensibilities, and my historian's promise to you is that I will never approach this craft with anything but max maximum enthusiasm. Today, that means marble. See, Naxos and neighboring Paros were known for their marbles since the very start of the Bronze Age around 3000 BC, as the defining art of the Cycladic culture was marble figure statues in a gorgeously minimalist style. These could look right at home in a modern art gallery, yet they're some of the absolute earliest art in Greece, and they were producing tons of the little guys. Now, to most observers, myself included, marble is marble, and that's certainly good enough for me, but back in the day, Naxian marble was especially prized. All stone has its distinct hues, undertones, contrast veins, and other qualities. In the case of Naxos, the stone was non-porous, which made it sturdier and more weather-resistant over time, but it also had a bright white hue, a faint translucency, and a bit of a sparkle, which all gave it a beautiful sense of depth in the light. But in addition to some of the Greek world's best marble, Naxos also quarried a rock called emery, which was crushed into powder and used as an abrasive to polish stone to a silky smooth shine. So between marble, emery, and material evidence that they were talented sculptors too, Naxos had a lock on the entire stonework industry, from rock to sculpture to polished product. And seeing as marble never went out of style, this would prove valuable to them for millennia. As the largest and most centrally located island in the Cyclades, or Cyclades in Greek, Naxos would have also been in the orbits of the Minoan and Mycenaean culture in the latter Bronze Age. But after the Bronze Age collapse of the 1100s BC, Naxos had the size, placement, and local merchandise production to eventually recover its role as a major player in the Cyclades. Once Greeks got back into the habit of long-distance trade during the Polis Age, Naxos surpassed all other islands in prosperity according to Herodotus. This is an impressive claim, yet it highlights the core problem we're about to run into with Naxian history. Once we get written sources, Naxos is always a side character, so we only get details as they're relevant to the bigger players. And in the case of that wily Herodotus, he's describing Naxos in 499 BC on the eve of an attempted Persian attack, so the pursuit of good drama might lead him to embellish the Naxian's wealth to boost the narrative stakes. Luckily, we know Herodotus does this all the time, so while we shouldn't trust that Naxos was the wealthiest, we can infer that it was comfortably well off thanks to all that marble. Specifically, at the sanctuary city of Delphi, various cities brought gifts and monuments as demonstrations of their piety and their prestige. And Naxos' contribution in the 560s was a sculpted marble sphinx atop a 12-meter ionic column right beside the Great Temple of Apollo. A few decades earlier, at the sacred island of Delos, the Naxians had furnished a dozen marble lions for a terrace near the sanctuary. So from two very public displays of wealth, one nearby and one on the mainland, we can verify that Naxos was was indeed rich and prominent, saving ourselves from the existential headache of trusting a pathological exaggerator like Herodotus. There are other snippets about Naxos that crop up across the centuries, from co-founding the first Greek colony in Sicily back in 735, to repelling that invasion by the Persians in 499, which inadvertently led to the Ionian Revolt, and by extension the entire Persian Wars, and three decades later being the first state in Athens' military alliance to try and leave, only to get besieged by Athens, forcefully demilitarized, and obliged to pay their alliance tribute in gold rather than ships or soldiers 
streak because clearly they couldn't be trusted. So we've seen Naxos had one of the longest running and most impressive records of marble working in all of Greece, and as a city-state they were present for some pretty big moments in Hellenic history, but I think there's one episode that captures not only their history, but is likely deeply relatable for hundreds of other cities in ancient Greece. So let's talk about a Tyrannos. The year is 546, and Pisistratus finally succeeded in his third attempt to install himself as tyrant of Athens. Ironically, for one man rule, he had some outside help from fellow aristocrats, and Herodotus name checks Ligdemus of Naxos as one such guy. The order of operations is a little vague, but Ligdemus provided Naxian soldiers for Pisistratus' power grab, then P Man took the sons of any political rivals who hadn't run off into exile and put them all in baby jail on Naxos, where he installed or reinstalled Ligdemus as its tyrant. This was part of a broader strategy to create a network of like minded aristocrats across the Aegean who then consolidated power over nearby islands. Athens claimed the sacred island of Delos, Ligdemus muscled in on Paros next door, and their friend and fellow tyrant in Samos had his own campaigns in the eastern Aegean. Around 530 BC, Ligdemus followed his political godfather Pisistratus and embarked on a hefty building program. A little way inland was his temple at Sangri, constructed entirely of gleaming Naxian marble. Notably, for any architecture enthusiasts, Sangri was a very early adopter of the Ionic style with those swirly column capitals. It's unclear how long it lasted before Christianity came by to swap out the program, but it was fully completed and remained in use for several centuries. This, however, cannot be said for the Temple of Apollo. Just north of the main port city, on a tiny islet, Ligdemus devised his crowning project, a massive, magnificent temple built with monolithic blocks of marble. This promised to be a masterpiece accomplishment that would tie the Naxians' millennia-spanning history of marble work with their ascension to political prominence as Athens' right-hand polis, a giant temple befitting a giant ego. That was the idea. But just because the guy in charge has some slick architecture plans does not guarantee history will oblige them, because instead of the biggest temple in the Greek world, Naxos got... nothing. Sometime after 530, while construction was still underway, Ligdemus was overthrown by a Spartan army, which I don't believe on principle because no Spartan has ever understood how boats work. I can't believe historians would fall for such an obvious lie. But regardless, the temple was unfinished. Some of its material was reused for a church after Christianity rolled in, and when the Venetians claimed the island in the medieval period, they repurposed most of the stones for their castle above the city. What remains is called the Portara, three gigantic marble monoliths that would have been the doorway to a spectacular monument monuments, but instead they're a doorway to nothing but the sea and the sunset. I've seen it in person, and the view is breathtaking, a blend of beauty and melancholy that its circumstances make all the more poignant, a picture-perfect depiction of hubris from a moment permanently unfinished, yet, ironically, one that's lasted far longer than most completed Greek temples. So much pathos from one empty doorway. All the details on Naxos we can glean from primary sources are included purely as scene setting for larger narratives at play. An Athenian tyrant here, a Persian invasion there. The actual downfall of Ligdemus is vague as all hell because it didn't affect the wider story. Any deeper records of it that did exist are long gone because they broadly didn't matter. And I'm struck by how much this kind of story must have been happening all the time. Somebody shows up, thinks they're the next Agamemnon, but the sauce is weak and they flame out before accomplishing their centerpiece project. So their home city simply shrugs and moves on. If Athens and Sparta are Athens and Sparta, the rest of Greece looks a lot like this. A place of culture and meaning and maybe even some standout artistic accomplishment, but voiceless. Sometimes things don't change the course of history. Sometimes they just are the course of history. Naxos might have been about to have their moment in the sun, but right when it seems like the clouds were parting, the wind blew, the clouds closed back up, and a hundred miles away, Athens had a sunny day instead, and Naxos would know. They saw it through their front door. Thank you for watching, and thank you all for the incredible support on my book, The Venetiad, which just wrapped up its campaign. I'm blown away by the enthusiasm for it, and we're excited to share production updates as the book gets moving. I cannot wait for you all to get it in your hands. Thanks as well to our patrons, whose names are on screen right now, and I will see you all in the next video.